Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com. And you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry. And we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Well, amen. Good morning. How are you? Man, that was good, wasn't it? Y'all give them a hand. Amen. Hey, I want to echo what Jake said. Uh, you can uh, sign up for any of those serve opportunities during the week. I know some of you have different uh, job schedules and that kind of stuff. So um, anytime during the week you want to come up and uh, put in a couple of hours, we would love to do that. There's a thousand little decisions uh, that take place every week to make all this happen. And so uh, we thank you. Thank you for serving. Thank you for being here. Well, we're in this new series. And so here's what I want to do. Uh, I want to do a little research this morning, okay? So I I'm going to ask you some questions and uh, kind of want to see where you fall on this. So uh, if you would, just indicate by raising your hand, how many of you guys love ice cream? Yeah, uh, pretty good. Okay. All right. All right. That's good. How many, uh, uh, how many of you guys love to exercise? Come on, raise your hand. Okay. If you love ice cream, you probably should raise your hand here. Okay. Amen. <laughs> you love to exercise. All right. Not as many. Okay. All right. Well, there you go. Okay. This would be easy. All right. How many of you guys would say you at least love someone in your family? All right, yeah, that's pretty high percentage. Some of you are like, I don't know. Um, uh, how many of you guys love conflict? Is there any psychos out there? Anybody? Oh, there's one sitting alone. Okay, all right, good. Um, okay. How many of you guys love being married? All right, if you're sitting by your spouse, raise your hand, okay? Just going to help you there, all right? Okay, Here, here's one. Now, this one, uh, let's see. Uh, how many of you guys would say you love money? <laughs> Some of you are like, can I raise my hand in church on that one? Can I really, I mean, can I be honest on that? I mean, yeah, how many of you love money, all right? Uh, it's okay, it's all right, yeah, okay. Uh, how many of you guys love not living in the polar vortex? Yeah, okay, all right. One last one here. How many of you guys would say you love the Washington Redskins? Oh, you're going to boo in church, really? <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Come to church and you get booed, man. There's no other place on earth, is there? You know, yeah, it's interesting. You know, I was thinking about these questions this last week about this word love. And, uh, you know, as I said last week, love can be used to describe so many things. Like, I love corn on the cob, right? And uh, I love hot showers. Anybody else, you know? No, I love cold showers. Yeah. You know, I love working out. I love my wife. But yet we all know that all those things, when we use that word love, they're just not equal. They're just not the same. And, and so this word love in our culture, for, for so many of us, it's overused and underlived out. And when it's underlived out, what happens is it affects all of us. It affects all of our relationships. It affects everybody in church and everything. And so last week, we introduced a definition of love that comes from God's Word. And we're going to be back in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 this morning. And, and then we're going to be looking at an Old Testament uh, love story in just a moment. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Chapter 13, before we get to the definition, I kind of want to give you some context of what Paul was talking about because Paul uh, kind of sets this whole dynamic up of love in the first three verses. I want to read those to you. Look at what it says. It says, what if I could speak all the languages of humans and of angels? If I did not love others, I would be nothing more than a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And what if I could prophesy and understand all secrets and all knowledge? And what if I had the faith to move mountains? I'd be nothing unless I loved others. What if I gave away all I owned, and I love this, and let myself be burned alive? I would gain nothing unless I loved others. Now, I love how Paul was setting this up, because Paul basically sets this up. If you were God, right? I mean, look at all that. You can speak all languages, you can prophesy, you can understand everything, you can move mountains, you, I mean, all of it, right? He says, if you don't have love, you don't have anything. And so then he says, this is what love is in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. Can we read this together? Would that be okay? 
Let's read it together. Ready? Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy, is not boastful, is not arrogant, is not rude, is not self-seeking, is not irritable. It does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Now let's pray and go home, right? Because how do you ever live up to that, right? How do you ever do that? And yet, last week, we saw those first three words that love is patient. I was telling Danielle this last week. We were sitting in the garage visiting, and, and I was telling her, you know, the church has done such a poor job of teaching on patience because we've been taught don't ever pray for patience because God will give you an opportunity to develop patience, right? And so what we've done is we've just become very impatient people in the church. And in reality, what we learned last week, if you missed it, you can go back and look at it. We learned last week it's not our patience. It's God's patience we're asking for. And so this week, I want to look at the next three words, and that is, love is kind. Now, I've got to be honest with you, when I, when, when I saw those next three words, I really just wanted to combine those with the rest of the passage. I really didn't want to take and talk about kindness and, and that because kind is kind of one of those bland words. It's one of those things like, eh, you know, uh, you know, the twin sister of that word is nice, Right? And who wants to be nice, right? Um, it's kind of bland and dry. And if you, if you look at that, you know, it's like, I don't know. I remember um, several years ago when we were brand new at Summit, we still, uh, still lived south of Longview on a lake there. Uh, south of Longview, we're about an hour away. And so we would drive every week and uh, we were coming in. And Tim, I got to be honest with you, this Sunday that, that I'm talking about, I preached the most incredible sermon I've ever preached up to this point at Summit Heights. I mean, it was awesome, y'all. So I got in the car, and Danielle and I were going back to Lake Cherokee, and uh, I, I waited as long as I could. We got almost to I-20 on, 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 on 14, and I just couldn't stand it anymore. So I just asked Danielle, I said, babe, what'd you think? And so she hesitated. I knew what she was thinking. She was saying, baby, you're a stud. I mean, you're awesome. You're incredible. They should name with a book of the Bible after you. You are awesome. I was waiting. And then she looked at me and said, it was nice. I've heard better. I've heard better. It was nice. For real? Some of you are like, can I laugh at that? You know, I mean, it's a holy smoke, man. I mean, if anybody in the world should say, Edward, you're amazing. It should be your mama or your wife, right? I mean, come on. Because nobody wants to hear nice. It's like a teenage boy, you know, he's in school and the girls are talking about all the cute and, 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 and the, all the boys in school and how hot they are. And the last thing a teenage boy wants to hear is that oh, he's cute, he's nice. Because he wants to hear he's, I'm a stud. I'm awesome, right? So for many of us here today, when you hear this word love is kind, it's, it's for many of us, it's just, it, you, you, we kind of combine those words nice and kind and it's kind of bland, you know, and, 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 and you, you just need to know that nice and kind are not the same thing. In fact, I looked it up this last week. I want you to show you the definition. When you look at the word nice, it actually says nicer, nicest, polite, or kind. And yet, here's the deal. And I want you to know this. They're not the same word because kind is devalued and toned down and it loses its faith context if it's just nice. Because see, I want you to understand that kind is potent. It's powerful. It's life changing. So when you think about this word, I want you to think of as kind is kind of top shelf and nice is kind of lower shelf or, or nice is JV, right? And, 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 and kind is varsity. Amen. How about this one? Nice is Walmart. <laughs> kind is Nordstrom. Amen. Some of you are like, oh yeah, come on now, that's right. Nice is the Hallmark channel that tells the same story over and over again in every show, right? Yes. Amen, I know that's a moan again. Again, booing in church, shame on y'all, you know? And, and kind is Netflix, thousands of movies, amen? I mean, that's good. Nice is the Washington Redskins. <laughs> kind is the Cowboys. Come on, yeah, yeah. And so people love Jesus in here, see? Here's my point, anybody can be nice. Anybody can be nice, because kindness requires something deeper. In fact, we, we, we know that this word kind, we've seen the campaigns, we know about it, and some of you even try it every once in a while. It's this thing called random 
of, yeah, Random Acts of Kindness, right? Do you know that February the 17th is National Random Acts of Kindness Week? That's next week, so you, don't, you got a week to work on it, right? Um, and so it's amazing. I went to this website this last week. I was researching this. You can actually name any day you want on this website. So Danielle's going to do National Danielle Week, uh, one week um, for her. And you can do anything you want to, but it's amazing that, that it's there. And so um, here, here's what I want you to understand. Because even... An evil person, an evil person to their core, and I think you'll agree with this, can still step away from their evilness for a minute and perform a random act of kindness, right? Anyone can be kind to impress someone. Some of you guys married him and found out he's not so kind, right? Anybody can step away. Even a wealthy person who's not normally generous can step away to quiet their consciousness and quiet uh, their, their kind of own greed and make a donation. Even a narcissistic, self-absorbed person can step back and perform a random act of kindness. So here's what I want you to hear this morning. That, that when, when Paul talks about love is kind, he's talking about something that's powerful. He's not talking about something that you can just randomly do. He's talking about something that is developed within and permeates every soul and every cell and every membrane that oozes from you and overflows from your body in an intentional way that enhances the lives of others. You see, this is the kindness we're talking about. In fact, I want you to see it on the screen. We'll say it this way. Uh, kind actions can hide an unkind heart, but a kind heart intentionally seeks to benefit others. You see, just like last week, we were talking about patience and circumstances versus patience and relations. This week, we're talking about kindness being intentional towards someone. That it's a relational thing. So kind actions can, ki can hide an unkind heart. But a kind heart intentionally seeks to benefit others. Does that make sense? Okay, that's, that wasn't rhetorical. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. So, so th this morning, what I want to do is I want to look at a couple in the Old Testament. And, and it's a book that you may not be familiar with. Some of you may, may know what it is. It's in the book of Ruth. And, and so if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. We're going to have this, uh, uh, the, the verses up on the screen. But here's what I want to do this morning. The book of Ruth, you may not be familiar with. It's only 88 verses. It's only four chapters. But I've got this new whiteboard that I want to uh, draw out the book of Ruth for you. And y'all know I love to draw. And so they finally brought me a whiteboard so I don't have to drag up that little bitty one up here anymore. So I, I want to draw this out for you this morning so that you'll know the book of Ruth and you'll be able to go home, be able to talk about the book of Ruth. But it's interesting because we have the book of Ruth and um, want to, uh, I, I've got notes, okay? So just so you know, because there's some big names in here and they're hard to say and they're even harder to spell, amen? So don't judge me, all right? It's because I don't have spell check on this board. I only have your laughter, all right? So don't, don't judge me on that. So, so what we have is the book of Ruth starts with Naomi. And Naomi was married, um, golly, I, um, Ella, Ella, um, <laughs> shut up. Um, Ella, gosh, man, I've been practicing this for weeks. Um, Elamaic, 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 Elamaic. I just did it. Okay, Elamaic. Okay, I may not get it right again. Okay, so you ever read the Bible? Because I know a couple weeks ago I got in trouble up here because I got to that one word I didn't know. And so when I read the Bible by myself, a lot of times I'll come across a big word and I go, and so Naomi was married to a big name and they lived in big name. And, and so, because I'm just kind of getting to that point, you know, and so don't, don't judge me anyway. Um, so, so what you have is you have Naomi and you have uh, Elamaic. We're going to call him Eli from this point forward because I don't want to mess that up. They live in the city of Bethlehem. Y'all know who else is from Bethlehem? Who? Jesus, right. Dallas Cowboy fans, amen. Okay, so uh, now Naomi and Eli had two sons. They had son number one and they had son number two. Okay, that looks like seven. But anyway, um, let me help out on that. So number one, so number two, and so they lived in Bethlehem, and here's what happened in the book. Uh, a famine hit the area they were in, and so Naomi and Eli had to move all the way down into the land 
of Moab. Now, if you don't know where Moab is, you got the Jordan River, you got the Dead Sea, and so they moved all the way down into Moab. And so now you've got Naomi and Eli, because that's easier, and you've got son number one, and you got son number two, and here they are, they're living down in Moab in a foreign country, they're way off in that, and so it's interesting, they do pretty well for a while, and they do pretty well for a while, and so what happens is son number one marries Ruth, the star of our story, amen? And so son number two marries Orpa. Yeah, name your first daughter that. Anyway, um, Orpa. And so they do really well. There's all kinds of jokes you could say on that, but I'm going to leave it alone, okay? Um, so they, they do pretty well for 10 years, and then everything begins to change. And I love this story, and I love the book of Ruth because it's most tragic, and yet it's also um, it's a great love story in, in this. And so they do very well for a while, and then what happens is son number one dies, son number two dies, and Eli dies, and it's crazy. We don't know how they die. We don't know if it's a snowmobile accident. We don't know if they fell off a camel. They don't know. We don't know how these guys died. We just know they died. And so what you've got here is you've got three ladies. You've got mother-in-law and two daughter-in-laws living in a foreign land. And so Naomi calls the girls together and says, ladies, things have changed. And so here's what you need to do. You need to go home and you need to be with your family. You need to go home and let your family take care of you. And so Orpah says, and I don't blame her. She goes, there's a lot of death around here. And so I, I think I'm going to take you up on that offer. And so she goes back to her homeland. She moves around a couple letters in her name. She then became Oprah, started a TV program. And I think she's done pretty well. Amen. So uh, she laughs. She's like, I'm done. Right. And so she went away and she went back and Ruth says this, and this is one of the greatest passages in Ruth. Look at it. Ruth 1, 16 through 17. It says, but Ruth replied, don't ask me to leave you or turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live, and your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. And may the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. And that's a mother-in-law's dream, is it not? Isn't that beautiful? And so Naomi and Ruth, they come all the way back. They come all the way back to Bethlehem, and now Eli's dead. And, well, let me go ahead and get my eraser because these guys are all gone. It's kind of a sad deal. And uh, so you got Naomi and you got Ruth. They're back in Bethlehem, right? And so the famine is gone, and they're here. And so one of the things about in, in this day uh, that, that when you're son or your um, husband died, the women lost their land because the land was attached to the male. So when they moved back to Bethlehem, they didn't have any land. And so Naomi went back to her family and there was this field there in the land and there was a guy named Boaz, there's another great name, Boaz, who owned that field. Now, he and Naomi were family, and so Naomi went to Boaz and asked Boaz, said, hey, would it be okay if Ruth grazed your field? I love that statement. If, you, if she grazed your field just to gather some food for us because we don't have any land. And so Boaz, we don't know if he was cute or nice. We don't know anything about him. We know he was kind, though. And, and so Boaz, in his kindness, he says yes. And so Ruth begins to graze the field. Now, you got to understand that what he said yes to was risky. What, what Boaz said yes to was risky because Boaz was saying yes to Ruth, and Ruth was a Moabite. She was a Moabite. Now, if you don't know anything about that, in the Old Testament, there were commands that Israel does not commingle with the Moabites. They don't do it because they were at war with them. They worship pagan gods. And so for Boaz to say yes to Ruth, it was a big deal. And not only does he say yes, but he addresses the kindness of Ruth towards Naomi. Let's look at it in Ruth chapter 2, verses 10 through 12. It says, Ruth fell at his feet and thanked him warmly. What have I deserve, done to deserve such kindness, she asked, because I'm only a foreigner. Yes, I know, Boaz replied, but I also know about everything you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. I have heard how you left your father and your mother and your own land to live here among complete strangers. Verse 12 says, may the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you've come to take refuge, reward you fully 
for what you have done. Here's what I love about this. Here's what I love about this. Kindness begets kindness. Now think about this. Here's what Boaz was saying, that, Naomi, that Ruth was kind to Naomi, which caused Naomi to be kind to Ruth. Boaz was kind to Naomi because he had seen the kindness of Ruth. And so what happens is, is that kindness begets kindness. Kindness triggers kindness, right? See, the reason some of you are not in kind relationships is because you haven't stepped forward in kindness, amen? I know, that hurts. So Naomi was incredibly kind to Ruth, and Ruth was so kind to Naomi, and then Boaz saw that, and he rewarded that, and they began to be kind to each other. And now Naomi being a widow, it's interesting because in Israel there was also a law, not just a tradition, there was a law that if someone in your family dies and leaves a widow or an orphan, the oldest male in the family would then come and marry that female, and then they would regain the land. So here's what happened, Boaz, because remember, Boaz and Naomi are our kin, Boaz goes and searches for the oldest male. When he goes to the oldest male, the oldest male says, no, I don't want to marry Naomi or Ruth because he was trying to protect his own kids. And so uh, Boaz made a deal at the city council or the elders of the city. And he said, look, I'll marry into, I'll take care of that. And you know, when we close on houses today, there's all that escrow paper and and you have to go through all that, and it's like signing a book. In their day, here's how they sealed the deal. They exchanged a sandal. Oh, here you go. Sounds good. So they made this deal that, you know what, you're off the hook, and now I can do this, and I'm going to do that. So the, 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 what, uh, what happens is, is, is after they exchange the deal, Boaz then becomes what's called a kinsman. Let me make sure I spell this right. Uh, kinsman, you know what it is? Redeemer. Now, here's what that means. The kinsman redeemer literally means the one who redeems. The one who redeems. And so, Boaz becomes the kinsman redeemer. And Naomi's too old to marry, so he marries Ruth. And, and so, he marries Ruth, and they get the land back. And so, when Boaz and Ruth get married, they have a baby. Now, watch this. They have a baby named Obed. And Obed had a son named Jesse, who had a son named David, and y'all know about David, right? He became what? King David. And we know that Jesus came through whose lineage? King David, right? And so in reality, Jesus' great grandfather and grandmother is Ruth and Boaz. And there's the story of Ruth. It's a simple story. In fact, what I love about this story, what's so awesome about this story, is that kindness wins even when there's ethnic differences. Think about it. You got a Moabite coming into the Israelites. That kindness wins even when there's cultural clashes. Listen, if there's ever a time in our country where we need to hear this, it's now. That kindness wins even when there seems to be no hope. But you know what my favorite part of this whole story is? And I hope my, probably when I was telling Danielle this the other night, one of my favorite parts about it is she Jesus juked me, so I'll tell you what she said in just a minute. Um, what my favorite part is is there's no miracles, there's no supernatural, there's no angels, there's no visions, there's, there's none of that. It's just ordinary people living their lives with God at work behind the scenes. And Danielle goes, well, that's supernatural. I know, but it's just normal, isn't it? And you know what? That's what I love about that, that God's at work and just normal. I see some of you think I'm just normal. And isn't it cool that you can just be just normal and God's at work? Now, in the New Testament, there's another story I want you to see this morning. It's probably one you're a little more familiar with. It's found in Luke chapter 10. And, and there's this conversation between Jesus and a lawyer. And the lawyer was asking Jesus, hey, Jesus, what must I do to receive, receive eternal life? And Jesus responded to him, you know this. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and spirit, and love your neighbor as yourself. And being the lawyer, he goes, oh, really? So what is my neighbor, right? And so he's trying to figure out what his neighbor is because that's, you know, and that's so... 
Jesus answered him with a story in Luke chapter 10. Let's look at it in verses 30 through 37. It says, Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man, Jew, Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits, and they stripped him of his clothes, and they beat him up and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now, Jesus said, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by the bandits? And the lawyer replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. Now, it's interesting, Jesus tells this story that Jesus puts an interesting plot twist in this story. He, he just doesn't just tell an easy story. He kind of thickens the plot because he takes two religious figures, and then he takes uh, the priest and the temple assistant, and he puts in there a despised Samaritan. Now, you may go, what, what, you know, why is he despised? Because that's what they were. In this culture, Samaritans were despised. They were half-breeds. They were half uh, uh, Jew and half Babylonian or half something else. They were half-breeds. In fact, there was nowhere in there a Jewish person would ever would have liked or valued a Samaritan and a Samaritan the same way. And so there was just not this way. And so the story goes that the religious in this story were the ones that didn't respond. You know the story. They didn't respond. In fact, they avoided him altogether because he was a problem. He was a pest, a hassle, an inconvenience. But the despised Samaritan comes along and he sees a need, he feels compassion, and he takes action. And that's kindness. That's kindness. He sees a need, he feels compassion, and he takes action. See, that's kindness. Let me tell you what nice is. Nice would be going over and going, oh, buddy, I'm sorry. Man, you are jacked up, man. That looks really right. And by the way, that, your blood's such a beautiful shade of red. I mean, that is so, listen, man, I hope you make it, man. It's, it's good. To, I, I'll talk to you later. That's nice, right? Kindness, look at this, look at it on the screen. Kindness is you see a need, you feel compassion, and you respond. Kindness is you see a need, you feel compassion, and you respond. Say it with me. Kindness is you see a need, you feel compassion, and respond. Let's say it one more time so it locks in. Kindness is you see a need, feel compassion, and you respond. Now, here's the most troubling part of the story. In verse 37, then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. Now go and do, that's a verb. That's an action word. That's why James chapter two says, you have faith? Oh, you have faith. So you have faith without works, your action or your faith is what? Dead. Hmm. See, Jesus was asking the lawyer to go and do, and I think Jesus is asking us to go and do. Because he's the personification of kindness. Everything about Jesus, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, is the personification of kindness. That's who God is. That's who he is. He is a kind God. In fact, the, I, I want to mention two things about God. The first one is simply this on the screen. I want you to say this. You might write these down. That in his kindness, he is patient in transforming us. And we talked about this last week. We talked about this last week. In fact, if you missed it, I really encourage you to go back and listen to it because God was kind towards us. But, but look at Romans chapter 2. This is one of my favorite verses. I love this. He says, don't you see how wonderfully kind and tolerant and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? You see, that's why he's kind. It is his kindness that leads to repentance. It's not repentance that leads to kindness. Listen, if you reverse that, you lose the gospel. 
If you reverse that, you lose the gospel. It is his kindness that leads us to repentance. It's not our repentance that leads him to be kind to us because he was kind to us long before we were ever repentant to him. You reverse that, you lose the gospel. You realize that. Some of you have lost the gospel because you think you've got to repent before God's going to be kind to you. No, it's his kindness that leads to our repentance. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever sinned and repented and then sinned again? Anybody done that? Anybody? Raise your hand. Come on. Yeah. Aren't you glad God's kind because otherwise we'd all be dead, right? Yeah, because we've destroyed people that have done that to us, right? But it's his kindness, his mercy, and his grace. That's his purpose. And that is that he wants to draw us to him. So here's the second thing. Not only in his kindness, he is patient in transforming us. In his kindness, he does the work to save us. This is a beautiful thing. Watch this. Paul's writing a young pastor in Crete in Titus chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. It says, when God our Savior revealed his kindness and his love, he, what, saved us. Not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sin giving us a new birth and a new life through the Holy Spirit. Love this. It was God's kindness that literally removes all the obstacles of good works. He takes all the obstacles of good works and he saves us, meaning this, you can't be good enough to be saved. Some of you are still trying to be good enough to be saved. And you need to realize that God's removed all those obstacles to say, look, I'm the one that saves you. I'm the one that saves you. You can't do enough good works to save yourself because it's not your works or your deeds. It is his. Jesus does the saving. Jesus does the saving. In fact, Jesus becomes what? Our kinsman redeemer. And Jesus didn't exchange a sandal. He exchanged his life. He exchanged his life, so we now are brought in to the family bloodline. It is in his bloodline to be the kinsman redeemer that he exchanged his life. He exchanged his life for us. And for those of us, we've been saved. We put our faith in Jesus Christ, our Savior. The Lord has become our kinsman redeemer because he modeled that towards us. It was his kindness that led to our repentance. And then he says, now, go and do likewise. And you go do it. Now, I would never want to sit up here and say that being kind is easy. Right? I, I'm just going to say that. Love is kind. It's not easy. And this, this may surprise you, but I, I'm, I'm going to say this. Kindness does not come naturally for me. Okay? Kindness doesn't come naturally. You know what comes naturally for me? Me. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, I, I, selfishness comes natural for me. I can be the most selfish person in the world. In fact, I am selfish even in my dreams. I can sometimes fake that I'm asleep so Danielle doesn't ask me to go do something, right? And some of you are laughing because you do the same thing. Yes, I see hands back there. Yes, you need to get saved, okay? So, I mean, yeah, you know that, right? I'm selfish. Listen, no one thinks of Edward Crouch more than me. Thank you, babe. Yeah, don't look at me that way. It doesn't come natural, but here's what I know, okay? And for you guys that are checking out Jesus and you're just not sure about him, maybe you're watching on TV or whatever, here's the thing. 35 years ago, I invited Jesus Christ in to be my Lord and Savior. I surrendered to him. And here's what he did. He moved in and he began a renovation project on me. And for the last 35 years, he's been renovating my life. He has been renovating my life. And one of the things that happens when you surrender your life to Jesus Christ, and if you don't know what it means to follow Jesus, you need to hear this. Here's what will happen. When Jesus begins to renovate your life, then what begins to come out of you is what's called spiritual fruit. It's spiritual fruit. So here's what's happened to me on this, because I'm teaching on love this morning. We're talking about relationships. We're talking about kindness. We're talking about patience. He's teaching me to love. I'm not as selfish as I used to be, but I'm still selfish. Amen? I'm still there. I'm, I'm more compassionate than I used to be. Way more than I used to be. I'm more gentle. I'm more self-controlled. I'm more peaceful than I used to be. I, I, now, listen, I still worry and I still get anxious. Man, I, I got to tell you, I woke up at 4 o'clock this morning. I was ready to preach this. I was ready to go. I was, I, I, you know, I, I was ready. I still have some things to work on. 
But through his kindness, I am being sanctified. I am being made holy. And listen, he's not done with me yet. I have a long way to go. Not as far as some of you, amen? Okay, I know that wasn't kind. See, I need work, amen? Okay. See, that's spiritual fruit. Look look at this. Look at this statement. This is so good. We reveal externally what is being renewed internally. We reveal externally what is being renewed internally. We reveal externally what is being renewed internally. The theological word for that is sanctification. In other words, the more Jesus is involved in my life, the more I become like Jesus. And listen, can, can I just say this? If you're not becoming more like Jesus, then what you're being renewed internally may not have anything to do with holiness. If, if you continue to, to be a disconnect between what you say you believe and how you behave, then you need to look internally to figure out what's going on. Because we reveal externally what is being renewed internally. You go, well, Edward, how do I know that? Well, let me, let me put three things on the, on the screen. I want to show you this. Because this is how you can kind of gauge this, all right? Number one, when love is kind, it's others focused. It's for the benefit of the other. You want to test how you're doing? You want to check what's going on? You want to check what's in, inside? Who do you think about the most? It's always others focused. And here's the second thing. When love is kind, it's compassion oriented. And by the way, this has Jesus all over it. Because Jesus would go around in town to town, city to city, and he would see a need. He would have compassion over them. And then it was followed by actions. It was followed by actions every time. And it's messy. It's messy. I mean, think about Ruth and Boaz and Naomi and that, that it kind of got messy in her. The risk of taking a Moabite and then bringing her into the family. Think of the Samaritan. It's messy. You see, when love is kind, it's others focused, but when love is kind, it's compassion oriented. And that's why some of us don't get involved because usually if you get involved, it involves a mess, doesn't it? See, here's the third thing. If you want to test your kindness when love is kind, it's often surprising. I mean, think about the Samaritan. I mean, you know the guy was laying there going, oh, there's a priest. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Like, where, where are you? What? Oh, there's a temple assistant. Yes, I'm saved. And he comes over and looks at him and then walks off. And then the surprise, the Samaritan, oh, he won't help me. And he got involved. There's always a surprise, isn't there? I mean, in the story of Ruth, in Ruth chapter 2, verse 13, look at this. It says, you have comforted me by speaking so kindly to me, even though, even though I am not one of your workers. You've been kind to me. She didn't expect that. She was a Moabite. Why should she have expected it? You see, here's the close, and, and I want to make it personal for you this week. How can you be kind this week? Intentional, not random, not random, but intentional kindness. Maybe it's someone from your work. Maybe it's someone in your family. Maybe it's someone on your campus if you're a student. Maybe it's someone in your neighborhood. And see, if you're sitting here this morning, I'm going to ask the band to come back. If you're sitting here this morning and you're going, Edward, you know, I got to be honest with you, I can't think of anybody to be kind to. And here's what I'll, I'm going to do you a huge favor. I'm going to give you my PayPal account this week and you can intentionally practice kindness all week long. Amen? Yeah, come on. So you're like, okay, I can think of someone, never mind, right? (laughs) See, that's what I want you to do. I want you to practice intentional kindness. Kindness. And I know what some of you are saying, Edward, what if I don't feel like it? What if kindness is just not in my heart? Well, yeah, the good news is you may not. And the reason is you're not fully sanctified yet. Amen? So here's here's what I want you to do, even if you don't feel it. Even if you're going, Edward, I'm just not sure it's in my heart. I'm just not sure. But man, I I, I hear what you're saying. I see that. But, but, you know, here's what I want you to do. Move in the direction of kindness. Okay, just move in the direction of kindness and here's what will happen. God will meet you in that movement. Just move in the direction of that and God will meet you in that movement. Here's what I know, God's spirit always responds to faith. 
God's Spirit always. It's all over the Bible. Move in the direction of kindness this week. And God will meet you in your faith. He'll meet you in that moment. <laughs> and when you do, you're going to love deeper. You're going to love like Jesus. You're going to express His kind of love. See, Jesus gave us a picture of kindness. And He said, go and do it. Go and do it. Be others focused, compassion oriented, and look for the surprises. So one more question. You ready for this? How many of you guys know someone that you can be intentionally kind to this week? Would you just raise your hand? Amen? Come on. All right, last question. And then we're going to respond. How many of you think you can do it? Yeah. Yeah. Love is kind. There's something powerful about that. Look for those surprises this week. Be intentional. Let's pray together. Well, Father, I love you. Thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you that we can come and laugh and have fun and even boo each other in church. <laughs> Lord, I know there's some of us in this room that very honestly, this whole thing of being patient and kind, Lord, unless you help us spiritually, we're, we're in a rut. So God, I pray this week that we would step out in faith, that you would meet us in that faith, that we would intentionally every day this week be kind, not random, but intentionally. And it might start at home, might start in our families, maybe our workplace, our schools, just as we're out doing life, there would be an intentionality that your Holy Spirit would move us and we would be known for those people when you said that you will be known by your love for one another. That God, we would become known as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ by what externally is exposing what's being renewed internally. So Lord, I love you. Thank you that we can respond this morning. Thank you that we can um, take communion for those of us that are believers and celebrate your death, your burial, your resurrection, that we have eternal life and God, that we long for the day you come back. Lord, thank you that we get to do that this morning. And we ask these things in Jesus' beautiful name. And everybody said, amen. Let's stand. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ. Or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.